Okay, Karma Weeks here from the NSCF Fly. And I am in the LA Basin, uh, checking on the 826, like that one on Yeager Avenue. And uh, I am coming out to pick up, I bought uh, two oil coolers for the Boomerang project down that Matt Danning's working on in Cobulcher, north of Brisbane, Australia. So, trying to find Pacific oil coolers. And uh, I'm getting close here. Anyway, we got there overhauled and uh, I called the guys and I said, hey, you mind if I, you know, bring the GoPro and check out your business and stuff? They seem to be like the place to go to for oil coolers. So, um, let's see here. It's got, a, it's in here somewhere. Pacific Oil Cooler Services. All right, well, why don't I just park right over here and uh, we'll go from there. Check it out. Okay, I'm gonna go see what we got here. Um, pretty plant. Here are classics. I don't know what that is. Pacific Oil Cooler Service. Not sure where we're going. What's happening? Kermit looking for Wayne. Kermit. Wayne Thomas, hey, how Wayne. are you? Good, 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 good. Welcome. Awesome. Super cool. I appreciate the uh, offer to tour around. Yeah. Check it out. I understand you guys would like the place here too, right? For doing all the coolers? Yeah, we'll um, we'll show you how that's done. Awesome. Okay. Good, good, good. Awesome. Can't wait. Come on down. This is our uh, engineering department. Are engineering department? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no way. Uh, quality control people. And... Um, I work in the sales department. Good. Our company president, Skid, right there. Oh, Skid. Hey, Skid. Good, good, good. Carl said hi. Yes, sir. Super. Appreciate it. Look forward to the tour. Yeah, come on down. Oh, my God. So this is the Mecca. The Mecca. Oil coolers and heat exchange devices. So we'll start the tour with the Pacific, the so okay. station side. Okay, sure. Cool. Yeah. And, and that all begins over in receiving. Oh my God, I've got one of these, a couple of these in my aerobatic airplanes. Yeah, we, um, we, we make 75 PMA part numbers. Oh really? Are you making? Yeah, I'll show you how that's done. Too. Oh my before God! You get, before you leave, we'll oh yeah. All that stuff so too. let me ask you something because I'm I'm thinking these are like silver. I seem to remember mine being like plated gold or something. So the old school way was yeah. iridite was the brand name for the uh, hexavalent chromate, right? Uh, which is what we still use on the repair station side, but on the new side over here at Aero Classics, we use a Trivalent chromate, huh. which is user friendly, non poisonous. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, all right. And it's clear. Well, that explains uh, my uh, mental abilities right now. Well, right? well, there you go. Everybody asks why why your cooler's not covered with anything. Well, if they are, it's just that it's clear. Yeah, okay, cool. Now, what does that go in? An air tractor. An air tractor? Yeah, you know, air tractor is the world's largest manufacturer of turboprop powered airplanes. Wow. And we're the OEM supplier of the air tractor. Oh my, what's OEM? Original equipment manufacturer. Okay, okay, cool. Wow. And Aero Classic is one of the few, maybe the only company that makes bar and plate and drawn cup type of tools. 
huh god they're so light too oh my god i can't wait to see how you make those all right, cool. So here's something going out to uh, one of our one of our great customers. You probably know. Oh them. my God! Good. Yeah. Hey, at some point, I mean, uh, I want to take these. You know, I'm going to take them to Carl, ship them. So at some point, I'd like to open the box and we look can, at them. Yeah, we can do okay. that. Okay. Cool. So the Pacific All Color Service starts with receiving all these coolers come in from literally all over the world wow a little oily yeah they come in oily and grimy and leaky and they leave like brand new oh my god please don't tell me you make rum here too make it in jamaica <laughs> no that's the uh, inert gas for our tig weld setup oh cool yeah there you go oh my god so what yeah what um alloy is the aluminum and like what kind of rod do you use when you it's a three the the coolers are made of a three double three right. aluminum and um we can ask the welders but yeah, i okay. assume that the, the rod they use is a similar yeah is a similar setup huh. the oh my god plenty of sheet metal yeah we got uh, that, I assume that's all owl clad. I would imagine so. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Here are the welders busy welding. Got one of those. Oh, those are cool. Oh my god. It's like an old cooler supermarket. Yep. So Kermit, this is Frank, our shop foreman. Hey Frank, how you doing? Kermit, Kermit Weeks, pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Frank is in charge of the repair station side, which uh, takes them in dirty and ugly and makes them pretty and brand new looking. Oh my product. god! Yeah. So this here's a report. Yeah, so this is this is one of the units where they come in and the core is not repairable. Right, okay. So we go next door. And we have them make a new core. A new core, first. okay. And then Pacific cuts it apart and welds it back together with a new core matrix. In it. Now, do you guys ever get anything that you don't have parts for, and then you have to make them, or you pretty much gotta handle on everything that's if, out there? If it's an aluminum right. core matrix that right. we need, we make it. Here. Okay. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because you just you got all the equipment, and it's long enough with bigger than anything you need and they just make it the fit. Yeah, so it's a yeah. it's it's a real hand in hand operation. The repair station and Aero Classics the manufacturing side. And do you guys any of like the brass ones like for the boomerang that I got, are those anything you all make from scratch or you just repair stuff? Um, we do make two uh, round oil coolers right. new yeah. out of aluminum. Out of aluminum? Right, eight inch diameter coolers, okay. like the ones for your boomerang. Right. And a seven inch diameter cooler for the uh, de Havilland huh. cooler. But are the, are mine brass or aluminum? Like the ones you're picking up, yeah. they're brass. Yeah, they're, okay. They're the original, original okay. 80 year old oil coolers. I see, but you don't make them in brass. No, they don't make anything out of anything except aluminum. And, and the, the manufacturing of coolers from aluminum requires, instead of tubes for the air to flow through, right. it requires fins. Fins, more like this? Or? Yeah, like, just like that. Okay. And I'll show you, yeah, huh. just a little bit here, I'll show you an example of cool. one of those coolers with a bar and plate core instead of the uh, round tube core. Good. All right. We're also a repair station for oil tanks of all of all types. I'll be darned. Man, that's a little one. Yeah, that is a little one as far as oil tanks go. Huh. Probably goes in a Tesla. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. 
these, these are off of like a Casa 212. For a what? A Casa 212. Oh, Casa 212. Yeah, the, the airplanes that people like to jump out of the bathtub. Oh my god. Yeah. Spend a little bit of time on the drain rack to get all the residual oil out of them. Right. And then the first step of the process is a the brass one right there. Yeah, that's, that's like an eight inch. This is a seven inch cooler seven off inch, of a okay. De Havilland Beaver. Oh, cool. Yeah. At least that's the most common application. Right. And the neat thing about these World War II vintage coolers is. Mother Nature has provided us a template to make a nice round oil for with the hexagonal shape too. Oh wow! Well, you know, you thank the beans for that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Man, I had no idea it was going to be this big. So the first, the first step in the overhaul process is a leak test. Okay. And this is normally about 140 degrees water. And it's very scientific, you know, looking for bubbles. Yeah, for sure. So, take them from zero to no more than 100 psi. Look for bubbles. Some of them leak at 30 and not at 80. Huh. So. And just out of curiosity, so the, the, the pressure normally in the cooler is going to be the, the pressure in the engine system and what's that usually at? 60 to 100. 60 to 100, depending okay. on the ambient temperature. Right. Huh. So the leak test is done here. If they leak, they get repaired. Then they'll leak, they leak test it again until there's no leaks, and then they'll go through the cleaning process. Oh my god, that looks like off a DC-6 or something. Yeah, those are... Um, like for a 2800 or something, 3350 maybe? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, maybe a Constellation, I'm not sure. Oh exactly my god. Uh, Gabriel here, he's What's been happening? I have. Yeah, good deal, good. thank you man. That's awesome. Gabriel, look at all the grass. Yeah. Aluminum food coolers. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, they just did two for me, so cool. Right. That's Aluminum awesome. Hey, when you get a chance, dig out some copper tubes so we can show uh, Hermit what they really look like. Oh, that's right. Oh, cool. Those. Right there, right here? This? No, these are the aluminum. Those are aluminum. Oh, those are aluminum. Yeah, those go on the... So the, the copper tubes, that hexagon right. part that you see, that's only on the like the last right. five eight right. tubes. You've been putting it in like swedge it or something like so that. Or, you know, soft or, powder. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the tube is round in the center portion and the oil is pulled in between. And I've always been fascinated by how you put it all together and then like dip it into something or... Yeah, oh yeah, I've done that here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there so we go. This is your typical World War II vintage tube. Right, right, right. And one thing curious about the World War II oil cooler is no matter the diameter of the cooler, right. if it's 24 inches or, right. or 4 inches, it's all 9.5 inches. Really? Somebody figured out just based on the flow and the efficiency. So out, that was the optimum. Really? Nine and, and a half inches? Yep, they're all nine and a half inches. I'll be darned. Except for the coolers on the faster airplanes, like the P-38 right. and the P-40. Huh. They use they deeper? They're 12, 12 inches. inches. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Wow, that's pretty cool. Awesome. Appreciate it, man. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Good guys. deal. Holy moly. Copper and brass. Yeah, you are getting way to go into the process right now. Uh, I just put the plate in them. I still got to pressure test them. And then after that, if they're good, no leaks, I'll 
Go ahead and ultrasound them. Yeah. Ultrasound, and what does that do? Uh, it, it cleans them. It cleans them. Oh, it cleans them. Cleans yeah. them. Okay. Ultrasound. You know, your, your, your favorite jeweler has yeah. that little ultrasonic clean on his table. Oh, That's what these are. okay. Really hot. Huh. Soap and water right there. It's at uh, 161 right now. I'll be darned. Uh, yeah, so we'll do, we'll, I'll put those in there. I'll put one at a time because you know, they're so big. And, uh, oh, yeah, no kidding, man. You got to have something that'll fit in there, huh? Yeah, yeah that's pretty heavy. You're going to do a lot of hard boiled eggs in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> put it on in there. <laughs> well, well, chicken in there. <laughs> oh, my God. Look at all these glassing cabinets. and. Yeah. Cool. The ultrasound has been part of our FAA approved process for about 20 years. Huh. And before that, we used a caustic chemical. Right. And it took days. This does in an hour, we think it's 24 Wow. Um, so in the old days in World War II stuff, they would have done it with a caustic yes, material. Yeah. I'll be darned. A lot of time and a lot of uh, bad smelling clothes when you're yeah. home. Oh my god. We ditched all that stuff in favor of the hot soap. Yeah, water. no, that's awesome. Oh my god, I had no idea it was going to be this big. I thought it was going to be a little shop. So, the follow up to the ultrasound is the flushing process. Every oil cooler will spend time on three flushing machines every single month. Huh. So these machines the same ones that the company built in 1961 when they first came Wow. It puts about 80 gallons a minute of solvent through the cooler, reversing direction of flow every 60 seconds, and this goes on for 12 to 48 hours, depending on how bad wow. it contaminates the cooler. There's so much stuff. Now, when you say contaminated, do you right. look up for like residual metal and stuff? Metal. You know? Mostly it's carbon that we get out of Right, it. okay. But whatever's in the lubrication system, the oil cooler makes a pretty good secondary filtration device. Oh my god. And I'll show you why as we get on down the road there. But um, these coolers have so much fluid being shoved when they get hot. Oh, I can't believe, I can't believe you're doing 80 gallons a minute. Yeah, that's why the cooler is warm to the touch. Oh Reversing direction of flow every 60 seconds. That is unbelievable. I mean, we're talking the ultimate colonoscopy here. Yeah, we're talking the clean is new when, when you're done. That's right. Oh my God. So, the final flushing bench, which is this one right here, has pristine brand new solvent and a 100 micron screen that we monitor until it comes clean. And there's no more debris found in the screen that we know. Right. So they'll stay on wow. this bench for as long as possible. So let me ask you as something. As if, is, yeah. is there ever ever an issue where, you know, whatever has been going through the cooler and what you've cleaned it out, does it abrasively wear it out from the inside out? Is that ever an issue? No. What what becomes an issue with all aluminum coolers eventually yeah. is corrosion. Corrosion. From okay. the outside. Yeah. From the outside. From the outside. Yeah, because so it's lubricated on the inside. Yeah, so it's well lubricated and, and preserved on the inside. Yeah. But on the outside, you got the ambient air flowing through these fins and right. it contains all kinds of stuff like moisture, dirt, and so yeah. And those those elements combined will over time eat a hole in the cooler. Yeah. Well, it's aged, but also, too, just sitting statically is one thing, but the fact that it's moving through it when it's flying, uh, you know, age crosses the... And, 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 yeah. and the I aging, think that's my problem. Well, and the aging speeds up in uh, coastal regions. In just what? In coastal. Oh, in coastal regions, yeah. It's because of the salt. It's really salty area. Yeah. yeah. So here's our... Uh, What's left of our World War II vintage oil cooler collection? Oh all, my God! These are as removed, just waiting for somebody to need one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Carl told me he had a bunch of stuff here. I think these are all for B25. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll be darned. There we go. Pretty cool. 
Golly molly. These are, these are from uh, one of our engine shop customers. He sends us two is by the pallet. My God. These are just waiting to go through the overhaul huh. process. So, here we got another air trader over here too. <laughs> So, does anybody else manufacture these besides you guys now? Um, um, I mean, none of the aviation, like Stetsner or Zeta, they don't make them, they just buy them from Right, them. so our, our main competitors are Niagara, the Niagara Falls, yeah. uh, Megat, to a small degree, um, and then there's uh, Honeywell, they make, they make yeah. mostly commercial yeah. and military parts. No. They, they've gotten, as, is, as have most of our competitors, out of the general aviation market. Really? Okay. Beginning about 20 years ago, which has huh. just kicked the door wide open for Aero Classic. Wow. We, we started out as a little bankrupt company in Ohio in 2023. I can raise that. I'm just in Florida. In 2003, <laughs> yeah. So, um, Timing was just right with everybody getting out of the GA market. Right. They just opened up the door. What year was that again? 2003. 2003, okay. When we, when we bought Aero Classic. Uh, huh. I moved it to California. Oh my God. And where were they located again? Huron, Ohio. Huron, Ohio. Yeah. Wow. Man, I can't believe this is way more sophisticated than I thought. Yeah, there's, there's, there's actually a lot of stuff going on. So we also overhaul and manufacture fuel heaters for PT6 powered airplanes. It's a what kind of heater? A fuel heater. A fuel heater. So turbine engines use Jet A, obviously. Right. Which is very adept at holding moisture and suspension. Right, okay. So when you get up to altitude at 60 below zero, okay. that moisture freezes in the fuel. Oh my God. So there's a fuel huh. heater attached to the engine. Its job is to heat the fuel up to between 70 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit, huh. just enough to melt the right. ice yeah. and keep them from clogging I'll up be the, darn. The, the nozzles. Now can you hook it up to the rudder pedals where it'll keep the pilot's feet warm? <laughs> I think there's cabin heaters for that. There's you cabin know. heaters for that. So now we're venturing into manufacturing, Aero Classic, and Pacific, the repair station. Oh, I see. Okay. That's the line in between that the FAA okay. we have to put on the floor. You're kidding. Now, they have some pretty strict rules where repair stations can't make anything. Oh, okay, manufacturers, okay. manufacturers huh. can't fix anything. Really? Yeah. Huh. So they allowed us to get by with just a huh. line on the Well, you see, that's a that's a government mentality, I think, in Washington D.C. It's the very 1920s. Yeah. yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Oh my God. All right. So we'll go down to the beginning over here for Aero Classic. What is this big thing? Uh, vacuum braze oven. So. There's an active ingredient, magnesium, on the raw material of the right. new coolers that we make. In the vacuum braze oven, you take out all the atmosphere, heat it up to 1,075 degrees. Hmm. It's just above the flow point of the magnesium clad on the raw material. Right. Yeah, it's just a few degrees below the melting point of the aluminum alloy. So you're putting the mag outside the aluminum? The magnesium is on the braze sheets, which is a part of the OCO that touches every single part of the tool. Huh. I mean, they usually use magnesium because it's lighter, so why are they using it as a coating? Um, it's, it's a bonding agent, okay. or a flux you might refer to it as. It just coincidentally happens to have the, the melting point just a few degrees below the melting point of the hmm. aluminum alloy. Hmm. I'll be darn, that is a big... And when you take out all the atmosphere, bring it to zero pressure, the magnesium actually vaporizes inside the oven. Wow. Huh. Yeah. All right, so we're heading down to the beginning here. Yeah, so... Um, a shear, power shear. 
Man, everything is jammed. We go right to the beginning stages of the whole assembly process. Good morning. I had no idea this was going to be this big. Oh yeah, there you go. So I had no idea. Oil coolers up tomorrow. Oh my, can I touch it? Yeah. That's a 5,000, uh, Kevin, Kevin here runs the, uh, Hey Kevin, what's happening, man? Kevin, nice to meet you, buddy. So oh you my air, God. Air this is what you see on the outside of the cooler. Okay, so you're basically just, I see what you're doing there. That is huge. Oh my God. I'll refrain from putting my finger in there. Yeah, that would be advisable. Oh my God, that is so cool. So let me ask you something. This um, looks like, I mean, this is kind of like one-off stuff, not a hundred. So did y'all make this stuff here? Or, no. or do you have a shop do that? No, provided by this company, Boss. Okay. They make the pin machines for it. Oh my God. And who supplies this, you know, like this? Usually it's our supplier, Lynch Metals. Okay. They supply us with the, all the raw materials, the coils of aluminum, oh and the bar stock. Oh my God. And they make records here too. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so this machine over here does a different style, the newer style Lance Offset. That's what this machine here. Yeah. Same thing, just keep your hands away. Okay. So you got a cam running that thing up and down. Is that pressurized or a spring? A spring. A spring. Can I take the one out? Oh my god. That is too freaking cool. So so what's the purpose of the different pin design? Uh, I'm not sure of that. Back to so, engineering decides what type of pin. There are many, many styles. Of okay. Pin. Uh, you got shark pins. You got dolphins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So this is what's called a lance to offset pin. Okay. It's got to offset every eighth of an inch into the core jack. Oh yeah. And it's got little louvers on each side of each row of fins. This is probably the most efficient in terms of heat rejection. Really? Air fin that we make. So, but how long does a 5,000 thick piece of metal Did last? Did we change to eight? Uh, it, no, five? just on some of this stuff. This is five still okay. here. So, God, the question again dang. is how long does it last? Yeah, I mean, you know. It depends on where you're flying. Yeah, you know. Yes in uh, coastal regions right 10 20 years might be the lifespan oh, yeah. of a cooler we're changing to some of this stuff and we're doing the eight thou material same fin just so, to make but, it a little more durable so okay so and how how more efficient is this than the other ones and and if you i guess the uh, how you shows up in efficiency is the size of the cooler yeah it it's it's all weighed against other factors like uh, the airside pressure drop Sometimes side pressure drop. Right, so the air hits the front of the cooler, and by the time it gets to the back of the cooler, the pressure has been reduced by the aerodynamic oh, I see. Okay. drag of the okay. fin. All right. So uh. it's a huge engineering calculation, and They've when we're making PM8 coolers, we're, we're required to make them as close to the incumbent oil cooler as possible. Okay. In terms of design. Right. Interesting. So that will drive our decision as to what type of fin to use for the most part. Huh. Well, it sounds like you've got a fin job. That's yeah, yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. That is. Oh my God. I just. I can't. Let me just look at these. Oh my God. So, what are our. 20 thousandths, 20 thousandths by three and a quarter. Huh. One of our largest pieces that we make is the P51D Mustang radiator, which uses uh, about a 
10 inch wide piece of aluminum like that for, uh -huh. the, for the fins and everything. So let me ask you something. Are you doing it the way Harrison made them? Like a Harrison radiator or it's no. a different fin design? No, so the Harrison radiator, as well as the, the Martin copy, right. uh, they're a very automotive type of uh, flat copper tube uh -huh. to the core with fins raised onto the copper tube. So ours uses fins. It's aluminum. Okay. They use fins instead of copper tubes. And who sells it? Martin? Martin sells them? Martin makes a replacement for the Harrison radiator. Right. But we can only re-core the Harrison radiator. The Martin radiator... Is a the, new radiator. Well, it's still at the same copper core, but they split the pre-cooler and the main cooler in a different direction. The pre-cooler and the main the, the cooler. The radiator is actually two sections. There's a small section, about a third of the radiator. Oh, that's for the inner cooler and the other one's for the radiator. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. yeah so, so it's in three parts and a third but, is... But the, but the Martin people, they split it the other direction, front to back in the core instead of on really? the end. Yeah, so the tanks, you can't use them on our core. You can only use the Harrison uh, tanks on our core. But, I'll be darned. But um, we've had quite a success to good market penetration with the P51 stuff. That's awesome. Oh my god, I remember when I first got my Mustang. Back then, you know, people were, still weren't really into like doing all that. Yeah. They, and, and, and the first time I took off, I'm like, uh, you know, I had like four emergencies and one of them, the thing went right to the red line. I opened up the emergency drop thing on the on the uh, the scoop down yeah. to the bottom. And uh, the guy said later, he said, oh yeah, just cruise around there for a while. You need to rod it out. So instead <laughs> of sending it to you guys, you had to take a like a friggin' a rod and actually rod and all the crap out of the wall. It's, 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 <laughs> it's a very automotive style type of radiator. Oh my God. Anyway, I, hopefully they don't rod radiators anymore. No. <laughs> oh no, my God. No such thing. <laughs> oh my so, God. That was back in the early days. Okay, so here's some of the... Uh, the deals here. Yeah, here's some of the um, dies for yeah. a particular type of fin that will change these out as needed to make. Uh, that is so cool. Fin is being required. It's kind of an oil cooler printing press. Sort of, yeah. You betcha. Oh my god. That's a scrap pile if you want to take it. Oh yeah, yeah. I want to take a piece home. Let me take a couple of pieces home. That is too cool. So what's interesting about this piece right here, this is this goes on the liquid side of the cooler. This is the part that you never see. Now all the, the oil has to make its way through all those little slots down the from one end of the cooler to the other. This oh, one, because this, this is on both sides? It's, it's got a piece of sheet metal on both sides. I to see, it okay. This feature right here has kept the Civic Oil Cooler Service in business. This is where all the stuff is trapped. Y'all got a patent here or on this? No, this is just, this is how the coolers are designed. Oh, I see. Okay. This is this is acts as a filtering medium unintentionally. Right. So this is um, this is this is required as part of the maximizing the surface contact area of the oil to huh. oil cooler. So so one of these things here in the cooler that would be like this way, it would go like this basically. Or? Actually, you have however many oil passes lined up and right. the oil flows across all of them and out the other side. Oh, okay, so it doesn't actually go through. No. Yeah, I guess, that, I guess that way it could get jammed somewhere. Yeah, and yeah. That, would, that would restrict the oil flow considerably. Oh my God, that is too cool. Let me get a little piece of... Yeah, help yourself. Oh, that too, okay, oh my God. Yeah, that's probably a pretty good amount of scrap price in there, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, we recycle about a ton a month, I think ton a month. Oh my god. There's a machine shop. Too cool. Oh my god. Oh, it's got to be too cool because it's a cooler place. There you go. It doesn't get any cooler than this. <laughs> yeah. Wave. So I'm giving Kermit the cooler. What's happening, man? So Tyler, oh, hey, Tyler. Tyler runs the CNC machinery. And, Too uh, cool. That is there. so okay. So what are you doing here? Are you just putting like the holes in here? Or? Yeah. So we're doing Probably. the flange yeah. holes or the mounting holes right now. Right. I just have to indicate it in and then get the offsets. 
too cool. This is the other type of CNC machine work that we do to the casting. Right, okay. And these are Continental engine mounted feelers that are going to uh, probably to Continental Motors huh. be used on the Cirrus SR20 and SR22 airplanes. I'll be darned. So I, you guys probably have somebody cast this for you. That's that's the only thing that we don't do in right, house okay. is the foundry work. Wow, the welding's great. That's yeah, freaking that's awesome. All, uh, and cage uh, welding. Yeah. Oh my God. Too cool. There you go, man. Oh, I, I, I think I'm just going to leave the shavings, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of I got samples. Thanks, you man. Appreciate it. God, look at all that. Look at all the shavings in there. Oh my God. So. I wanted to show you our P51 radiator, which is way over yonder. Okay, yeah, no sweat. Because we can get around that. Here's um, here are examples of round brass oil coolers, right. which were made in the 1940s, and they're still viable. They're yeah. Still functional today. Um, the repairability is is very high on these type of coolers. Now, most of them they get knocked around a little bit. Right. Things in here. Yeah. Huh. So are these brass or are those aluminum? This is aluminum. So okay. this is a mid 1950s. Um, this actually is used on a constellation. Oh wow. But in that transition between brass and aluminum, they made aluminum coolers with tubes, and the tubes are round and they're swedged into this header plate. Like a locomotive steam boiler. Huh. They're expanded into the header plate. So when you say swedged into the deal, is yeah. there is there like a little bead on the? No. It's so it's so when you say it's just a straight tube. So when you say to swedge it, I mean all you can do is expand it a little bit, but just it, a little bit. But so it's enough to keep it from leaking. How does that these, work? Yeah, in theory, these are the most troublesome types of oil coolers, the <laughs> aluminum ones, because there's no added material sealing that tube into right. the oil cooler. It's just a yeah. interference fit after the fact. Huh. Um, so you get a little bit of corrosion in between there. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And oh, you pull the God. tube out and put a new tube huh. in. I mean, it would be lighter, you know, than a brass one, but yeah, it's, it's still. Yeah, it's significantly lighter. Interesting. But, but so the reliability just... So what's the difference in the design of this one on the outside, but this one's kind of like a brass one? Um, this is for a Super Puma helicopter. Uh -huh. It's just a matter of... Uh, but it's aluminum as well. It is aluminum as well. Just a matter of the designer of the aircraft chose this But does style this of also fluid. have the swedged... Yes. Really? Yes. There's no added yeah. material to seal these tubes. Yeah, see on the brass ones, they've got them all here and then what they do, they somehow set them in like a, a soldering oh, tank. I'd love to go see that if yeah. you got it. Yeah, we, we don't actually do that extensive work here. We, we can replace individual leaking tubes as right. needed. So there's, a, there's right. two soldering guns. But you don't make them from scratch? No, no. We, so we just, so we just let me ask you something. I know yeah. in the vintage community, you know, there's like very few people that really like to coolant radiators. Not oil coolers, but like liquid for liquid cooled engines. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, so they used a similar type design, like, like World War I stuff. And a lot of automotive radiators through the 20s, 30s, and 40s were made just like this. Yeah, I'm sure the airplane guys were using the same thing the cars guys were. Interesting. I mean, it was the technology of the day. They, they didn't, they might have had aluminum at their disposal. However, there was no technology to join aluminum pieces and mass hmm. like we have today with the vacuum brace oven. With a what? With the vacuum brace oven. Oh, okay. The, the huh. te that technology didn't come out until huh. 1960 or thereabouts. Hmm. So yeah. before then, they were soft soldered together. Right. That's pretty cool. Here's, here's one of our. Oh well, now that's weird. Square, square peg in the round hole. <laughs> I think that's a trans cooler right there. So this <laughs> is our uh, FAA approved DHC2 to have on Beaver oil cooler. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh two, my two God, right that is just too cool. So 
bar and plate technology lets you build a cooler of any shape or size. Right. Except you can't make them round. Yeah, really. They have to be square yeah. on the outside. So, huh? We've included the. And, and, and did they test these to determine which one was as or more efficient? That's part of the FAA approval process. Right. Is you have to show that your replacement cooler is at least as good as that. As good or better than yeah. the, in, the incumbent nice. cooler. Yes. Oh, that's these are. Correct. Now, pretty cool. Yeah. These are those big 118 pound mothers right here. 118 pounds. Yeah. Oh my God. Like a locomotive part. That's a P51 Mustang oil cooler. Oh, there we go. Wow. This bad boy right here, 22 inches in diameter. He's on the Douglas Sky Raider. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Huh. Wow. But I mean, the uh, yeah, but that would have been uh, that was right after World War II, like World Korea early. Yeah, in the 50s. This, yeah. was, this was the technology of, of that time. Oh, okay. Cool. Aluminum cooler with two. Huh. Wow. So, the, uh, okay, so that's kind of the cooler stuff. Now, how about like the, uh, the thermostatic valves and stuff? How do they actually work? So, oil coolers with valves in them um, are they usually attached. Separately. They're usually integral with the cooler. Right. So here's, here's a few examples. Because I mean, like with the boomerang, I remember ordering three things per cooler. Yeah, so right. on, on your coolers, there's the cooler, then there's a valve body that attaches to the cooler, right. and a vernithin that screws into the valve body. Okay. On this Bell 206 oil cooler, the vernithin screws directly into the cooler, as is the case with most modern stuff. Right. So what this does, the oil comes in here, and it tries to flow past this valve and go out. Okay. If the oil is cold, that's what happens. Yeah. The oil comes in here, and it goes out here. It doesn't go through the core of the cooler. Right. So when the when the vernitherm heats up, whoop, I'm dropping my samples. Yeah. So as the oil heats up, usually to around 160 Fahrenheit or thereabouts. The vernitherm extends in length and shuts off the bypass port, forcing the oil to go through the cooler. So I've wondered about that. Obviously, when something warms up, it closes or opens. It opens. It opens. Well, okay. It, it, it extends in this length, which closes off. Okay, but the is it is it but is it the, the the metallurgy of the spring? that is put in some sort of a thing that basically says when it gets to a certain temperature it'll do this and they may shorten or lengthen them based on there's, there's a thermal wax so in this cap with this vernitherm right here there's a thermal wax capsule which is the active ingredient this is used in car radio thermostats oh All so the, the spring from, doesn't do the job the wax does the there job is, there, there is there is also a spring on here because the vernitherm serves two functions one is to keep cold oil from going through the core of the cooler. Right. And the other is to act as a pressure spike protector of the cooler. Huh. So the seat on the vernitherm, it is spring loaded. Okay. So is, is there like a, a big one like on my cooler we could look at somewhere? Yeah. So let's we'll see what we got over over yonder in vernitherm land. Vernitherm land. Uh, over here. <laughs> Oh, we just crossed another yellow line. We're in Vernitherm land. So we talked about our re-core process. These are the core matrices for the units that Pacific re-cores over yonder. Huh. All made by our friends at Aeroclass. We are in the matrix. So here's a pretty typical Vernitherm. One that I can't get the box open for, but anyways. 8130, which means it's a PMA part. So here's your vernitherm. Very typical. Okay. The size may differ, like right. yours has a big, yeah. about almost twice the size of this. 
So, yeah, it's a guy thing. Yep, there you go. The um, active ingredients, the wax capsule is up in here. Okay, and, and so obviously this screws in there to close that in and that's liquid? So, uh, it, it's wax. Oh, it's, it's paraffin wax. wax yeah. With uh, some sort of steric acid added to it. Um, so this stuff expands with a tremendous amount of force. You can stick one of these wax capsules, capsules under the corner of your house. Right. And if you heated it up, it really the side of your house. Huh. So well, you know, we need to put that under all the seats in uh, the Washington DC, you know, know, to get them off their asses. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Heck yeah. Um, so this this thermal actuator here pushes this whole thing out. Not by very much, only like two tenths of an inch. Oh, still, that's a lot, though. So, so I, I, I find it hard to believe that something that is a certain size would small. expand that much. Yeah. Really, so the spring is really just to act as a buffer. It it's doesn't a, actually... I see, yeah. okay. So if the pressure differential on the oil side from inlet to outlet right. exceeds about 40 psi. I see. It'll push its way past the spring loose oh, okay. seat that and go sense. down the bypass route of the cooler Okay. because the cooler is the weakest part of the lubrication system by far. Right. Yeah, because the engine and everything is pretty pretty stout. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So these, these are basically similar in all types of coolers then. Just very kind of inside. Two, two, yeah. today. Huh. There are some previous designs that instead of a instead of a wax element, they use a copper bellows which changes dimensions with temperature. Huh. But those are like really old. I'll be darn. That's how they started out. Huh. More core matrices for a recore for Wow. We are in the matrix. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then we can come over here and look at your cooler. Yeah, cool. Sorry, I didn't think about this when we're over here. Before. Oh, no, no. You can hear all the welding going on. Yeah. Watch your eyes. Yeah. yeah. 40, 50 hours a week, man. That's all we do. Wow. So here's um, here's that turbulator plate, which acts as the filtering right. element. Right. Oil has to make its way through all those little holes. I'll be done, and it goes from this side or one side to the other. Right. I in, see. In okay. One, in one pass. Oh my gosh. Huh. And that's where all the stuff collects. Oh, there we go. I recognize that. Yeah, so this is a Harrison... These are Harrison tanks from 1942. Right. With our new... Yeah, this is... That's different. This, this is our... This, this is our construction right here. So, the pre-cooler and the main radiator are separated right. this way. On the Harrison, they're, they're separated this way. Excuse me, on the... On yeah, the, on yeah, the yeah, yeah. Radiator. Yeah, so this is... This is for the inner cooler right here. You see where that split? So you got about a third here and two thirds here. So this is what cools inside the engine like in the, uh, the, uh, the cylinder jackets and stuff. And that's the intercooler. You would think that the aluminum core matrix is a lot lighter than the copper. However, because this is mounted so far after the CG, huh. we wanted to keep the weight as close as possible. To the right. This, this weighs only about 20 or 30 pounds less than the wow. top before. So we added things like this 5 thick billet right. aluminum end plate right. to help weigh the cooler down. And, and the fins, the air fins actually add a significant amount of weight to the cooler too. I'll um, be darned. But by putting this big, thick 
fill a piece on, on each end of the radiator. We brought the weight up to the normal. Right, and we've also huh. eliminated the other stuff like the sheet metal and the stiffening rods that were on the original. Right. So, I mean, this looks like it's been in and this a little been, dinged this, up. This has been through uh, an operational cycle on some of these 251. Right. And it's just there for clean. I'll be darned. Are those steel? Yeah, they're, so they're just... Yeah, they're stainless. They're stainless. Oh, yeah. my God. Whenever we take one of these apart or build it new, right. we use all new stainless steel. Right, okay. Oh my god, that's a, yeah, it's very different than a, just a stock World War II Harrison radiator. Yeah, anyway, I'll go figure that out. You guys who don't have a set of Harrison tanks yeah. that we can use for their new core matrix, we have a company who makes us these brand new. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay, go. Cool. Yeah. And, and let me ask you this, how much... How much difference in efficiency is this compared to, or is this the way it's originally the same? Okay. Yeah. It's, not, it's not noteworthy, more efficient, but it's, uh, they don't need And how different is the core, how, the, the, the manufacturing process? I'm well, trying to remember what the other one looked like. Remember, the core has, the core has this. Right. So the, the liquid sees the end of this that's this deep. Right. And it has to make its way through all those little passageways. Right. But I'm thinking on the Harrison, where I used to have to like rod it out. Well, <laughs> on the Harrison, you take the tank off. Right. And what you see are just like looking at an old automotive radiator. Right. The flat copper tubes. Okay. That's right. That's yeah. right. And that's what you had to run the, the, the this, rods through. This is much more tightly knit with that turbulator plate in there. So you can't actually run it. Right, 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 right. Okay, cool. That's yeah. awesome. Well, oh, thank you so much, man. Thank you very much. Too cool. Yeah, good. Yeah. Can look at your stuff now? Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, well, that looks packed pretty good. Super. That's a double box. All right, cool, man. So if we could look at the coolers, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and then just do a quick repack. And so I did pick for you the best looking ones that we have. Oh, well, thank you. Sure. That's awesome. Well, I tell you what, I think there's like maybe one or one boomerang flying right now, and we're yeah. going to get a couple more going. Oh, good. And it whistles, too, man. When it flies, it just, <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's more than one of those F4U4 whistling death Corsairs. Yeah. Oh, my God. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Yeah. So we got you brand new Vernotherm, new old stock Vernotherm. These here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. So yeah, the oil yeah. goes in there and that basically keeps it from... Yeah, the act actually the oil goes in here. Okay. And if the oil's cold, it goes out the outlet part right here. If the Vernotherm extends and closes off the bypass route, then it goes in here and through the core of the cooler. Cool. Awesome. I mean, would it be too much to just pull one out really quick just to kind of look at the... There we go. Awesome. Just to see the end of it. There we go. So... All right. There's your 80-year-old uh, oil cooler. Oh, my God. Man, I'm right behind it. <laughs> uh, you and I both, yeah. Oh, that is too cool. So, so in this case right here, so what's that repair? So apparently there was a leak on that too. Right. Okay. So and it was easier just to easier do. Easier just to. Right. If there's if there's only four or five leakers. Right. Right. Okay. Just cap them off. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Rather than disturbing all the tubes with a soldering iron and right. taking one. And, tube it, and I assume it's on the other side too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, the, the the when the oil goes in, does it just come in here and it goes all the way around here on its own? The, how how does the flow work in on this part right here? So. It varies by cooler, but on this cooler, it just drops down onto the tubes. Right. And well, where does it? So it comes in here, and where's yeah, actually, where's it come out? There's a there's a divider in here, so the oil oh, goes, so it goes this, this way, way and out the other comes way. Out that way. I see. Yeah. yeah are, for some correct. reason, I was thinking you know it might have gone like this, but it just goes through and well, comes actually, out. Well, actually, I gotta correct myself one more time because when the oil is cold. 
it doesn't just go in and then out. It goes around the shell and oh, then out. Oh, that's what this is for. That's right. There's a little bit of space I there. I see. That's what just that, that little does, bit right there. It helps to keep, helps to warm up the cold, thick oil in the cooler. Right, So right. it acts as a non-congealing feature. I see. Which is really ingenious. Huh. And it usually opens up about 40 degrees or something? Yeah, these World War II Vernotherms, they're, they're in the... There's a temperature stamped on it. I think these are 71 C. 71? Yeah. Oh, really? So it's, the engine's got to warm up to 71 before the thermos thing before pops. The, before the, the okay. oil flows through the Oh, that makes sense. Through. That makes sense because, because normally you're running about 100 degrees or something like that. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Oh my God, super. All right, I appreciate that. Sure thing, thank you very much. Oh my God, well, I'll tell you what, maybe while he's packing it up, I'll run to the restroom really quick. Yeah. I'll, I'll, All right, cool. I'll point you in the right direction. Does it sit there or not? Maybe, maybe not. That guy with muscles, man, that's awesome. Yeah, I just want to make sure it'll fit. Well, there we go, okay, Perfect. cool. Oh my God. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks so much, man. Good man. deal. Appreciate it. Back at you. Thank you. Okay, good Thank deal. You. Good deal. Amazing. I couldn't even believe what I just saw. So. <laughs> I, I see. There's always more in store than meets the eye from the outside. <laughs> Drive careful. Okay. Back to Aero Trader. Current week's over now.